This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. It's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about this economy right now. And it's a very, very important show because what we'll be covering is how can you see the future? In other words, the question, if you're sitting at home right now worried about your job or your business, whatever you worry about, there's a, lot to, there's, a lot worry about. About. <laughs> there's a lot to worry about. There's a lot to worry about. Is what is going? What does the future hold? And that's why this is probably the most important program. But it's not. See, most people just watch the stock market. That's all they watch. They don't know much about whether much the home prices in their neighborhood, and that's not good enough. So our guest today is George Gammon. He's my new hero. I mean, he <laughs> takes the ultra. He takes the ultra complex and puts it in pictures. So you have a chance. His, his program is called Rebel Capitalist on YouTube. Please follow him. Even if you don't understand him at first, just keep tracking with him because you're going to see what 99.99% of the world's population will never see because what George puts into pictures is the real cash flowing through the monetary system. Any comments, Kim? No, I'm just um, anxious to get started because the, the, the two of you are like bookends and you, you just complement each other so well. So I'm just ready to get started. So I want to welcome, welcome George. I want to jump in right away, but George, <laughs> George <laughs> welcome. Tackle this beast. Let's do it. I just yeah. want to provide so, as much value as I possibly can right, to your right. viewers. Thanks. But you guys have got to track this guy, man. He's the best teacher we got on planet Earth today if you want to see the future. So, George, give us your background. How did you become a fortune teller? <laughs> <laughs> well, first and foremost, I almost flunked out of high school. Yeah, me too. So <laughs> we, we, we have that in common. And uh, But I knew once I, I got done with school that I wanted to be on the B side of the cash flow quadrant. So I was an entrepreneur from the very beginning. Uh, I had a few successes, a, a few failures. Uh, I was fortunate to be a self-made millionaire by the time I was 34. And then I got to about 38, 2012, and I said, you know what? I've built this machine that's consuming all of my time. I don't have that much freedom. I would rather be on the I side of Good the cash flow you. quadrant. So you. I retired in 2012, and when I did, I got into macro, and I was in the Marina Bay Sands in Singapore. I remember it like it was yeah. yesterday. I had about yeah. 10 hotel. minutes to blow know that hotel. My, yeah. yeah. You guys, I, I love that place. It's awesome, yeah. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. I had about 10 minutes to blow before my dinner date, and I was just on YouTube, ironically enough, and I ran across the series from Milton Friedman, Free to Choose. Hmm. And that took me right down the rabbit hole, and he articulated so well what had been in my mind just, you know, for so many years. And then I got into uh, Thomas Sowell, then Jim Rogers, Jim Rickards. I remember watching videos of you, Robert, on YouTube when you were on CNBC talking about Lehman Brothers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but that's really what got me involved with macro. And I've been obsessed with it ever since. It's all I talk about. And um, then we go to today where I've got this YouTube channel that we started about six and maybe about eight months ago. Yep. And um, it's just grown tremendously. I do whiteboard videos on macro, trying to break these complex topics down into sim simple, digestible videos using a whiteboard. Uh, it took us eight months to get to 100,000 subscribers. We're growing quickly. And um, I'm having a lot of fun interviewing people like you, Jim Rogers, uh, Brent Johnson, just all these people that I looked up to for so long. And yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't realize, George, that you also um, followed the same philosophy in real estate that Robert and I did, in terms Absolutely. of buying cash flowing real estate. Yeah. To and, and it, at one point, your your cash flow was it was greater than your living expenses, just as we did. Yeah, that's absolutely right. In 2012, it goes back to macro, and I looked at a chart of the U.S. housing market going back to 1900, adjusted for inflation, and I saw that we had just been in this massive bubble, and we came down. 
but we were in 2012, we were right at our historic trend line. So I started studying Japan, the crash they had in 1990. I saw that their home prices went down by about 60%. At that time, we were down by 50%. So I figured that it would be a good time to go in. The cash flow was super, super cheap back cheap. then. The cash yeah. flow is actually cheaper than the assets themselves. Right. So I went almost all in uh, with real estate in 2012. And um, I've been doing it ever since. Now I invest in real estate in real estate inside and outside of the United States. Right. And right now, where are you located? I'm in Medellin, Colombia. What a great place, man. That's a beautiful place. Anyway, I want to get back to why you should be listening to George Gammon here. And the reason is, is similar to me. I took the financial statement, basic accounting, and made it simple. Assets versus liability and statement of cash flow. And what George does, he took the plumbing system of the whole economy, of especially the United States, the Treasury and the Fed, and he put it into pictures. So let me show you what George does. This here is the most boring diagram on planet Earth. <laughs> Straight from the Fed's website. <laughs> and, and you wonder why we're all screwed up, because this is what the Fed, those academic, those A students, PhDs, there's 900 PhDs in there, and they should all be shot at dawn for putting this garbage out. And so what George does on his, his uh, site, Rebel Capitalist, he puts this into pictures. And I'll say this again because the most important, you know, Kim and I started off with our board game Cash Flow. And we were talking about it a couple of days ago about how our brand at that time was Cash Flow. And what happened, Kim? Why did we change brands? Uh, we were in we were in Australia with a friend of ours who was a marketing marketing guy, and uh, he said, "You know, what's what's your best selling product?" And Rich Dad Poor Dad had taken off by this time in Australia was huge in Australia, and mm -hmm. uh, we said, "Well, the best selling product is is Rich Dad Poor Dad." He goes, "That's what people know. They don't know cash flow. They all they know about cash flow is cash flowing out of their pocket." <laughs> he said, yeah, "Your right. brand your brand is Rich Dad. That's how they know you, and that's how we we." instantly shifted our brand to rich dad from cash flow, yeah, we but we know. still love cash flow, and yeah. I am the queen of cash flow. I'll just yeah. go on record as <laughs> saying that. So, so George, let me, I'm, I'm doing my best, man. I want everybody to tune into you on a regular basis at Rebel Capital, because what George does is see, he takes this boring piece of doc. He look, if I can't sleep at night, I'll read this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but when, it, when people ask me, where did I grow up? I actually grew up in oil, in oil fields. So this here, and Sarah will post it, this is an oil refinery. So every time I watch George's whiteboard presentation, he's actually showing us part of the plumbing. And the reason plumbing is important, it goes back to cash flow. Because when you're looking at this plumbing of an oil refinery, I don't know where it is, but I grew up in the refinery of Richmond, California, because I was sailing for Standard Oil as a student and all that stuff, most boring place on earth, but anyway. I'm watching the cash flow. So the pipes, all of these oil pipes and refinery pipes are showing the direction of flow of oil and gas and all those other things. So the way you predict the future, you've got to watch the cash flowing. And that's why what Kim says, most people have no idea what that mean, word means, it's going out. So financial intelligence or financial IQ is can you turn the finance, your cash flow back into you? And because most people have no financial education, their cash keeps flowing out. You know, the, number one is taxes. Number two is they buy that house, they call, a, they call an asset, but it's actually cash flowing out to the bank. And number three is your 401k or your IRA, whatever you've got. The cash is always flowing well, out. It's, it's also why everybody's going to get these stimulus checks and that cash is just going to flow right out because yeah. they don't have anything flowing back in right now. So let me say it one more time because we are an education company. We don't sell anything but education. But George has a power to take this and put it into pictures like this on his whiteboard. And the reason you want to study what George is saying, because he's going to keep you up to date on which way the cash is flowing. It is the most important thing a person can do. So you want to see the future. You want to see which way cash flows. So what George is talking about is this chart here. You know, this, this was a subprime crash up here, 2008. Yep. And he entered the market down here. And that's what smart guys do. Most guys were running, but he entered the market right here. Kim and I entered right there also. Mm -hmm. We borrowed $300 million with Kenny McElroy, and we thought we died and went to heaven. You know, It just took off after that. So what do you want to say about this charge, and how did you jump into 
Real estate. And what is this chart? This housing that, home prices. Home sorry, price. home prices. Yeah, yep. those are U.S. home prices adjusted for inflation going back to 1900. And I think you you touched on some crucial components there, Robert. And number one, when you let's use an example, of what you did in 2000 uh, or during that time of the housing. Uh, crisis. You borrowed $300 million to go in and buy cheap assets and to buy cheap cash flow, but you're also buying assets that you could depreciate on paper. So you could take that cash flow and you didn't have to pay taxes on it. And I want to point that out because in today's day and age, we might get into these cycles that we were talking about with Ray Dalio earlier, but we're right at the top of one of these cycles and the government is going to be left with a choice on how they, you know, they tighten their belt, they create inflation. But one of the main things they'll most likely do is increase taxes. So unless you've got uh, some sort of vehicle set up to where you can decrease your tax bill, if you're on the left side of the quadrant, you're going to have some big, big problems coming up. And I'd also take it a step further. And most people don't know this. In fact, I've never, ever heard anyone talk about this except for just the research I've done on my, on my YouTube videos. But they actually changed the tax bill in 2018. So as you know, they increased the brackets based on a certain measurement of inflation. Well, they changed the measurement of inflation so it increases the tax bracket slower than it otherwise would have. So if inflation is going up at, let's say, uh, let's just take it to the extreme and say it goes up 100%. Well, if they only increase the tax brackets by 2%, then you're going to be paying a lot more of your income in taxes, a greater percentage, although your purchasing power might not go up. So the government is playing all of these tricks to make sure that they pick your pocket, whether it's explicitly or implicitly. So and, that's, that's, and that's income taxes, that's property taxes, that's all kind of taxes across the board, isn't it, George? Yeah, that's, that's income taxes, correct. It's Social Security. There's a lot of things where they made this shift in the way they adjust uh, the CPI, they call it. They went from the CPIU to something called a, a CCPIU, which, again, is just another way of calculating inflation, but it, but it understates inflation. And that also applies to GDP. You know, if, if we've got nominal GDP at 5%, and the, go- and the government or the Fed is telling us that real GDP is 2%, that's because they're adjusting 3% for inflation. But what happens if, if that number that they're adjusting by is artificially low, that means that GDP is artificially high. So if you go back the last 10 years and say, boy, you know, this, this economic boom or this recovery that I've been hearing about on the news, it doesn't feel like it's been a recovery. I I mean, I hear everyone talking about it, but it sure doesn't feel like it to me. That's because if you actually adjusted for the real rate of inflation, real GDP might've been uh, zero, if not negative over the last 10 years or so. Right. So everybody, please listen. George is speaking over my head right now. (laughs) He, he thinks I make it simpler. I mean, I even make it doggy simple. But I want to encourage people to chew, tune in to Rebel Capitalists with George Gammon and just track them on a regular basis. And slowly over time, it'll start to make sense to you because what George is watching, again, is like an engineer would be on a on a uh, you know an oil refinery. Which way are things flowing? And right now, the cash is flowing out at high speeds. Yeah. And... And George talks about it, calls it the repo market. And the average person doesn't know what the repo market is. And that's where the hemorrhaging is taking place. Is that correct, George? It is. And I think that's a a, a great point, Robert. In our discussion the other day, we talked about uh, one of the videos or a few of the videos I did on the repo market and how you saw the problems in the repo market and that because you were paying attention. Can I back up? A lot of people don't know what you're talking about when you say repo market. What, What is the repo market? Yeah. So let's dive into that. I'm going to make it super simple. So really what happens, uh, we have all these banks in the United States, hedge funds, financial institutions, and they need cash. They have a lot of assets. Let's say they've got a big piece of land, 
but in order to make payroll or rent, they, they can't sell that land quickly. So they have to come up with the cash. So they'll use that land as collateral. And I'm just using this as an example. They'll use that as collateral to get the cash they need to fund whatever it is overnight or a term repo, maybe call it 20 days, 30 days. So these are repo agreements or repurchase agreements. And I could get into the technical no, mumbo the jumbo, but basically <laughs> all it is, is it's, oh. just, it's just a quick loan between two parties. Right. So if it's if Robert has a truck, let's say, and he needs a thousand bucks to pay some bills. Well, I've got the thousand dollars. I'll give it to Robert. He gives me the truck as collateral. We trade back the next day and Robert gives me a little bit of a premium for that loan. That, that's what a, a, a repo is or a yeah. repurchase agreement. It's just uh, done between all these banks, financial institutions, and hedge funds. So back September 17th. Wait, 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 wait. Hang, hang on, George. So <laughs> this is what George is talking about. Please, hit Correct. It. it's rebel capitalist. He'll be talking about one section here. The next day he's talking about something here and all this. So even if he, I, you know, if you don't understand it now, it's a rebel capitalist. Tune in, find out what George says. The more you listen to him, Pretty soon, the cash yeah. flowing will make more sense to you. So oh, the, George, yeah, the so, whiteboard videos are just George Gammon. That's the YouTube channel, George Gammon. The Rebel yeah. Capitalist Show are the interviews that okay. I do with guys like you and Jim Rogers yeah. and Rick Rule and Doug Casey and all right. those awesome guys. So, so let me let's, let me say something. So, one of the reasons we got out was we could see the repo market is very simply banks get in trouble too. They come up short of cash, like all of us, except when they come up short of cash, it's in the billions. Yeah. And well, that's Robert, why, that's why Lehman went bust. Yes. And because that's they couldn't how you access know. the repo market because no yeah. one wanted the counterparty risk. Right. And that's how you know. So I'm, you know, please tune in to George Gammon. Follow him on a regular basis. Every time he explains something to you, you'll get a little clearer. And that's how you see the future. So, and so what are you seeing in the future, George? Well, going back to hey, September Plaza. 17th in the repo market, we saw interest rates spike almost up to 10%, which was totally unprecedented. Usually it follows the Fed funds, which was called 1%, 2% right around there. So if, if you see this happening, you know that there's something wrong underneath the water. You're seeing the tip of the iceberg. You're seeing the so, top of that wave, but you know underneath there's a lot of problems. And that's what prompted Robert to take some, some action. So yeah. I think I, what I want to stress, and I'll explain this just momentarily, but what I really want to stress to the viewer is that if you're able to just start to understand the macroeconomic picture. And it doesn't need to be complex. Listen, the, the reason you think it's complex is because all these economists and academics, they use all this jargon and yep. technical terms. But if you just break it down into simple English, it's actually very easy for people to understand. And if they understand it, they're gonna be able to make much better decisions for themselves and their family on a, for in the, in the future for their, their finances. So I, whether it's me or anyone else, make sure that you're trying to really pay attention to what's going on. So that was the first rumblings that you saw in the repo market, wait, wait, but so, then so, we had the virus kick wait, in. Wait, wait, so, so wait, 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 let me give right. a hint. What happens is the debt to the consumer, I could go and borrow, buy a house for like say 3%, but in the repo market, they raise the interest rates to 10%. Overnight, yeah. That meant they didn't trust the banks. You see, when George was saying that, you kind of get a picture. There's problems in Denmark someplace. Do you know what I mean? They the banks can't cover their shortfall. And that last uh, video, you know, that was the last one we do with Marin Katusa. You talked. He talked about swap lines. Swap lines are very different than repo. So the reason you want to pay attention is when Marin came on. He was talking about the swap lines. He says something made my blood curl. He says a swap line is when the U.S. Federal Reserve lends money to Japan. They lend dollars so Japan can then pay their bills in dollars. So the Japanese have no dollars. So a swap is the Fed says to Bank of Japan, we'll loan you. We'll loan you the money so you can pay us back. Imagine that. Correct. And he, yeah, and, and that's and, it. they've got swap lines and they've got FEMA set up. Wait, 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 a repo wait, wait, wait. market for international yeah. banks, so it, it gets a lot worse. But yeah, I think the average viewer might be listening to this saying, "Okay, Robert, I get it." But what? How does this apply to me? When Marin says 
the Bank of Japan, which is a federal, it's, a, it's, it's like the central bank, they had to borrow half a trillion. That's a lot of money, short term. So when he said that, I went, oh my God. Again, the reason you want to tune in to George Gammon's programs, if you, the more you watch it, pretty soon it starts to make more sense and you can see the future. So you're not caught just watching the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So we come back with going more with George Gammon, his fabulous program. And fabulous we're going to go YouTube. into just what you were saying, George. What does this mean to me? Right. And what sure. can I do? And how do I benefit from all of this information? Absolutely. So that's why if you really want fantastic education, better than anything you get, in, at least I got in college, it's the George Gammon Show. We'll be right back with George and more on how you can see the future. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the good news, the Rich Chat Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. It seems I still have my allergy. But anyway, you can listen to the Rich Chat Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes, Android, or YouTube. And please leave a comment whenever you review it. And all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them because we're an education company. And if you watch this program again, you'll learn twice as much. But most importantly, if you have friends, family, and business associates who really need to step up their financial education, go to richdadradio.com, listen to this program we have with George Gammon because he is the man with the plan right now. I mean, I'm blown away at how simple he makes the most complex things that are invisible to most people. And again, the theme of this program is how do you prepare and see the future so you're not caught in the next crash because this last crash caught a lot of people flat-footed. Any comments, Kim? So, yeah, so George is a, he's an expert in the, not just the macro, but the micro too, but we're talking a lot about the macro, but he's also an entrepreneur, he's a real estate investor, um, has a fantastic YouTube channel, George, George Gammon, G-A-M-M-O-N. Um, and so George, you know, we've been talking big picture, we've been talking yeah. macro, um, so our listeners may be asking now, hey, what about me? What does this all mean to me? Absolutely. Yeah. Let me dive into that. So we were talking about the repo market as an example. And Robert, you have that great picture of the oil rig and all the plumbing going back and forth. That's basically the dollar funding market. So how it applies to the average Joe and Jane. Let's just say that you uh, have you know, you've been saving your money, you've been working hard, you've been doing all the right things, you've got a little nest egg saved up, and you go to the bank, and you're like, oh my gosh, they're only giving me 0.5 interest or zero or who knows what it is. It's, you can't even see the interest rates, they're so small nowadays. So you say, okay, where can I go to get a little bit higher rate of return? But I still wanna be safe. It's gotta be safe. So then you might look at a product like a money market mutual fund or a money market fund. And then you look at this, you say, well, that's safe. All my buddies are doing it. It's just like a bank account, but I get maybe a 1.5% return. Well, what the average person doesn't realize is they're taking exponentially more risk just to get that 1% additional return. So how is that? Because the way that the money market mutual fund gets the additional return is they take your hard earned savings and money and they put it into the repo market or they put it into the commercial paper market, which is basically funding for corporations, the same type of thing. So the question then becomes that that person that's just watching Monday night football and just enjoying life, just, you know, with the, the white picket fence, the two kids, the golden retriever, they don't care about what's going on with the plumbing. They don't care about the dollar swaps, but does that person really want to lend their hard earned savings to Deutsche Bank, to HSBC, you know, some of these banks that could be crumbling as we speak, or to put things into other terms, like more America-centric corporate terms, would that individual want their money being lent to American Airlines <laughs> right now, or Boeing right now, where every single time you turn on CNBC or the TV, you see that they're asking for another bailout because they're about to go bust. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's how this macro and that's how the cash flow and the plumbing that Robert's talking about, that's how just one way that it can affect the everyday person. So I, again, it's financial education and what George is talking about is vital. Again, it's about this plumbing, which you'll never see beneath the surface. And it's a lot of plumbing. So every, yeah. every program I watch George, he's talking about one little section like I said, I grew up in these things as a college kid, looking at this and this and this, but they all affect the whole. 
It all affects the whole. So if our banks are going bust right now, what does that mean? Do, do you know well, what I mean? Yeah, it's not just the banks. It's the government. It's the private sector. It's our entire economy because the, these debt cycles run in courses of 75 to 100 years. I'm going back to Ray Dalio. And Ray Dalio has some great YouTube videos on this. But he's got charts of the long-term debt cycles and the short-term debt cycles. Uh, long story short, right now we're at the top of a 75 to 100 year long-term debt cycle. So the only way from here is down. And Robert, you 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 call this in a lot of your your books, and you kind of predicted this and, and had the foresight to see this coming. But when you get to the top of one of these debt cycles, the only thing the government can do well, there's four ways out of it. Number one, they can choose austerity which very few governments do, and that's just tightening the belt, spending less, everyone feels the pain. Think of the uh, deflation or depression we had in the 1930s. Or they, they restructure the debt. Well, it's not likely we're gonna do that with China. It's not likely we're gonna do that with the big banks because they're the creditors. And, or they could just default, say, hey, we're not paying you. Or what most governments do is they choose money printing. This is creating inflation to bail out all the people who have the debt, whether it's governments, whether it's individuals. So it, when, once you get debt to a certain level, you've got to, it, well, you don't have to, but most governments choose to inflate it away. So let's, what does that mean for the average person? Well, if the government is going to try to create inflation, meaning the cost of goods and services going up, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're positioned for that. So as an example, if you just own your own home, uh, you've got to make sure that you've got a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Because if they try to create inflation, if interest rates go up, then your interest rate is going to go up unless it's fixed. And what happens it, when you're a debtor and they create inflation, you're going to have the opportunity to pay the loan back your mortgage with cheaper devalued dollars. So the way they can think about that is if they borrow, let's say $100,000, the rate of interest means that they're paying the bank back with increased purchasing power because you've got principal plus interest. So what happens in inflation though, is inflation allows the, the borrower to pay the debt back with less purchasing power. So if your rate of interest, let's say is 1% or 3%, we'll call it. But if inflation goes up to five, 6%, the delta between those two is a transfer of purchasing power from the bank to the individual homeowner. And I think a lot of people listening to this probably have a mortgage, if not on a rental property, on their own home. And I think that's the very first thing they can do to be proactive. Also gold, silver, Bitcoin, you talk about that all the time. And um, I could continue to go on, but that's where I'd start. Well, this is this is why I, I cannot, I've, I've been watching George for all, almost, almost a year now, when he first came out. And it, it kind of, it was a, it's called a confirmation bias. Because when Kenny, our partner, called, he says, I think we should start selling some of our junk. Not that it was junk, but it was non-performing. Well, and first, and first what we did is we fixed all of our interest rates. Right. We fixed we all our interest rates on our properties. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> and, and so we, we got rid of our non not our non-performing, but less performing properties. Yeah. So we're, we're floating high as a kite right now. Yeah. And the Rich Dad Company is doing very well because the cash keeps flowing in but we're in position for it. So those are the reasons I cannot stress more. Uh, I'll show this picture again. I'll be redundant. I'll be nauseous about it. What George does, he takes, if this is the whole world economy in here, he'll show you where it's flowing at different parts of it and where the log jams are and what you've got to look out for. So in 20, in 2009, September, 2019, when the repo market backed up and interest rates were 10%, the average guy was watching Monday night football or whatever they watch. They had no idea the whole thing was coming down on them. Yeah. So that's, so that's why I cannot stress. That's why Kim says, every time I'm talking about George, it's like, you know, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> but one more thing, Robert, if you remember our conversation, you talked to me about how important it was to invest as an insider. 
Right. And I think that's another thing that the average person can take away from this conversation is that you can look at macro, you can start to understand it, but it doesn't mean that you have to be an expert for you to utilize it in your own financial situation. So as an example of that, uh, as you guys said, I got into real estate in 2012 and then in 2014 or so I started investing outside of the United States looking for better returns. So in 2015, if, if people remember back that far, we had the price of oil crash very similar to what it's done uh, recently. It went to about $30 a barrel. So back then I didn't know anything about uh, oil. I was just kind of getting my my bearings with macro, but I knew that uh, I, the, these prices wouldn't last for the long term. So I wanted to go long oil. I wanted to buy oil, but I didn't know anything about it whatsoever. But I did know that the Colombian peso was loosely tied to oil because they produce a lot of it. So I thought, okay, well, if I can buy pesos, well, then that's kind of going long oil, but I don't really know anything about currencies either, but I do know about real estate. So what I can do is I can go to Colombia, I can buy real estate denominated in pesos. So then what I'm doing is I'm buying oil with something that I actually know about. The alternative would have been to go in and maybe buy bonds. I would have gotten crushed in, in uh, Colombian peso bonds, or I could have bought something like the ETF like USO. And back then I didn't know that USO, they didn't, the underlying asset wasn't oil. It was future contracts. So if I would have bought it back then, uh, long story short, I would have lost a lot of money where instead I made a lot of money by first looking at the macro, having a decent understanding, and then ask myself, how can I apply this to something I know well? And it doesn't have to be real estate. You could be a pharmacist. You could be a school teacher. You could have some sort of expertise where you see something. You're an insider where other people aren't. That, Great point. Listen Great to point. listen to him. Listen to, but he also something invest in what you know. Yeah. Right. Very important. And very, 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 very important. Is this sound advice? So, so I can I ask a question? Sure. We're, sure. we're sitting on this coronavirus, which is yeah. changing everything. What what is your crystal ball? What are you seeing? Not your crystal ball because you're studying it and you're seeing all the charts and the numbers. What what are we looking at? Well. From an economic standpoint, I think the biggest question is, do we have deflation or inflation? And that's kind of the debate going back and forth. And f for the average person, I think they just have to look at the entire economy as supply and demand. So the supply is how much stuff do we produce? How much goods and services? Demand is how much money we have or our willingness or our access to credit to go out and buy the stuff. So as most people know, we're, we're in lockdown, uh, you know, depending on what state you live in, what city. So there's a lot less demand. There's a lot less of the goods and services that are actually being purchased, right? So that decreases the demand equation. That's what most people get fixated on. So they think, okay, well, we're just, we have to have prices going down, deflation. But they forget about the supply side of the equation because if the people can't go out to produce goods and services, well, the supply will go down fast as well. So then the question becomes, what's going down faster, demand or supply? Well, then you look at this, the supply chains that have been disrupted coming into the United States. If you go to Walmart, Target, Home Depot, the majority of the stuff you see on the shelves was produced outside of the United States. So if those supply chains get disrupted, that means less supply. Then what happens is usually going back to Dalio's example of long-term debt cycles, you get social unrest. And I, I hate to say that, but that's just the reality of the situation if you look at history. And typically the way the politicians take care of social unrest is through helicopter money. So whether you want to call it MMT, UBI, it doesn't matter. It's basically the government spending money into the real economy, getting into the back pockets of the average Joe and Jane. We could see a situation in the future where the Fed is actually doing it. They're not technically allowed to do it right now, but they've been breaking all of the rules. So if there's more money in the pocket, uh, of the average person, that means there's more demand, even though they're sitting at home, not going to, to work 
for those goods and services in the economy that don't require debt. That's key, Kim, because people see deflation and inflation as just this, it's, it's binary, right? It's either one or the other, but it's actually very nuanced. So if there's less debt in the system, that means uh, asset prices could go down or via cars, anything that most people buy using debt. Yeah. Okay. The prices of those go down, but anything people buy uh, or most goods and services people buy on a daily basis that don't require debt, such as groceries, those prices typically go up. And if right. I saw on CNBC the other day that in a lot of markets around the United States, food prices are up as high as 25%. It's already so started. You can see this yeah. happening in real life. Yeah. The, what's happening is because of the COVID or whatever they call it, the meat packing companies are shutting down. Yeah. And, exactly. and so there, there's now shortages of meat, but what, what, um, so great George example of supply decreasing faster than demand. But what's happening is there, and the Fed is pumping trillions, 2.2 trillion into the economy. So you have a decreasing supply, increased liquidity. And that's why the shelves are empty for pork and beef and all those things. And uh, Arab Spring, which I don't forget when that happened, but the real rioting wasn't about Muslimism or Christians and all this. Huh. Arab Spring was because the mom and pop couldn't afford to go to the store. Food the prices, prices went so high. It. And I think that's what you're saying is when people get hungry or they can't afford food, that's when the social situation gets worse. Correct. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're out of time, but I cannot encourage you more. Please go check out George Gammon and his rebel capitalist show and listen to his guests. You know, I'm on it constantly because I want to see the future. I want to know what's coming down the road. Not tomorrow, but what's coming down the road. And like I'll say it again, George is the only guy I know who can take this thing here and show you a little pictures of it. And that's the whole monetary system, which is in a mess right now. So George, thank you very much thank for being you, part of us. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for having me, it was a pleasure. Keep teaching, keep teaching. You're the best, man, you're the man. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Thank you. All thank right, you. take care. Thank, thank you. you, George. All right, guys, can't wait to do yeah. it again. Well, when we come back, we'll be talking to Kim and I about what we see in the future. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And we broadcast from Old Town, Scottsdale, Arizona, where it's empty. But anyway, it's, it's a beautiful time of year here. You can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes, Android, or YouTube. And please leave a comment whenever you listen to it. And all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them because repetition is how we learn. You listen to this program one more time, you'll learn twice as much. But more importantly right now, especially in this economy, or what's going to happen in the future, please watch this video with friends, family, and business associates and discuss it because the future is not going to be the same. The future changed just recently. Any comments there, Kim? Well, I, I really enjoyed George because he does keep it simple. Um, and unfortunately, he does. The, I'm not going to say unfortunately, but the, his insight into the future given the coronavirus is very, he, he says it very simply, very straightforward that when demand for goods goes down and when people are not working, they're not going to be spending money on things except necessities like groceries and toilet paper. Um, but then also supplies going down because as you mentioned that pla that meat packing places are shutting down and dairies are shutting down and, um, and when that happens and food prices start going up, then we're going to have, we're going to have major, major chaos, worldwide chaos, because yeah. people aren't going to be able to afford food. And when they can't afford food, they do crazy, crazy things. Yeah. They can, they can put up with a lot, but no food. Yeah. Not, not without food. So anyway, I was, his name is George Gammon, G-A-M-M-O-N. He's a rebel capitalist. His interviews are fantastic. His whiteboard presentations are fantastic. So let me just say something. I've been studying this stuff for years. And when George is talking, I'm listening, but I'm still hanging on for dear life, you know, because that boy is really smart. And he talks about the repo market, the commercial paper market and all this. And the last interview I saw him was on swap lines. And, and those are terms that they don't ever teach you in school. And they're the most important things you can watch today because like our board game is cash flow. All we're doing is watching cash flowing. So right now, if your cash is flowing out of your pocket and you're sitting at home or whatever you're doing, your business is hemorrhaging cash, then that should be a sign from God. You better make some changes because you've got to be able to change that cash to come back into you, flow into you. And that's what George does on a macro scale is where's all this cash flowing to and from. I mean, I thought that was a fascinating example of he wanted to invest in oil, but he didn't know anything about oil and he knew about the 
the Colombian peso, um, but he didn't really want to do currency. So he <laughs> went to Medellin, Colombia and started buying real estate based on the Colombian peso. I mean, that's, that's smart stuff. <laughs> yeah. And that's creative. Real quick, Robert, for our audio only listeners, can you explain that picture real fast? The oil rig? Yeah. Okay. This is what you do during college. This is where I spent my time. This is not an oil rig. This is an oil, a, a oil processing plant. So oil comes in and it comes out as gasoline, kerosene, jet, J, JP4 and all this stuff. So my degree is in oil you know, and architecture and shipping. So this is what I studied. And the beautiful thing of this plant here, this, think of this in your mind of George's whiteboard, but he's only taking one section of it at a time. So if you listen to him over time, you get to get the bigger picture of what's going on. And he uses the exact terms an economist or a real sophisticated person would use. For example, repo, repurchase market, or commercial paper market or swap lines, those are crucial because they're showing you which way the cash is flowing. But the difference with George is he explains what those words mean where so many economists just use, as he said, all this jargon and this confuses me more. He explains it simply. Now, but he also said, and I watch, I love his stuff because he's definitely macro and micro. And he was saying most real estate guys are not even micro, they're mini. You know, say, oh, what schools in this district? Oh, good school. I think I'll buy here. Oh, interest rates at 2%. Oh, okay, I think I'll buy here. But they missed the bigger picture. And the re I cannot in encourage you guys more to listen and watch. Just follow him. Check it out. If you don't understand it, so what? But sit with a friend. Like Kim and I will oftentimes discuss these things. With husbands and wife discuss. Well, how's the repo market doing today? <laughs> But we want to know where that money is going, who's hemorrhaging. And right now, the repo market is hemorrhaging. You think you have money problems? The repo market has bigger problems. And I just saw Royal Viking Lines or some of the big cruise ship companies. They just went bankrupt. They just declared, Lord and Taylor just became, declared bankrupt. And that's why the repo market is going broke. Because all of the debt that financed what Royal Viking or whatever the heck they are, or Lord and Taylor or, you know, Neiman. Uh, Jack, who Neiman Marcus just went back up, all comes from the shadow banking system, which is the repo market, swap lines, and commercial paper markets. So George is the only guy I know who puts it into rough pictures. And if you can track that, even if you don't understand it fully, you'll be able to see the future and make better distinctions. And he, I agree wholeheartedly. That I think we're going into hyperinflation. We're going to go to deflation for a little while. Prices will come down but they've pumped so much money. I mean, trillions. They claim it's 2.2 trillion, but we don't know how much they pumped into the repo market. See, we all know about the 2.2, but how much is going into the repo market? That's the question. And while that money flushes out and there's no pork chops out there, there's gonna be a, there's gonna be a fight at the counter. You know what I mean? And again, that's where Arab Spring blew up was because the Arabs didn't care who was winning the war, the oil price of oil. They couldn't eat. They couldn't afford to eat. Any comments to that, Kim? No, I, I, it's a scary scenario. And when he says social unrest, that's a real real possibility now. Yeah, if you can't eat, you get nasty. Anyway, thank you. I want to thank George Gammon. And please tune into the show, George Gammon, G-A-M-M-O-N. The Rebel Capitalist Show's interviews are fantastic. And thank you all for listening to Rich Dad Radio. Thank you.